Hello everyone, thank you for clicking on this video. This is Sean Weathers, and I am the Cinephile. This is audio of Dune author Frank Herbert talking about the mythology of futurism at UCLA on April 17, 1985. Don't distress if you notice that the audio and video don't quite sync up. That's because there was no video for this. So rather than showing you a still or stills of Frank, or stills of Dune, I'd rather just show you a video of him talking. So I use video of other interviews he did while this audio played. Check out links in the description for podcasts I did covering Dune's part one and two, as well as a reaction video I did of watching Dune part one for the first time. While you're here, please like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. Enjoy. I thought I would talk about the mythology of futurism because <clears throat> this is one of the things I've addressed for a great many years, longer than I care to tell you about. <clears throat> and I'd like to begin by telling you <clears throat> what got me started on it. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt appointed a group that you may have heard about. It's called the Brain Trust. The Brain Trust was supposed to lay out the course of hard science and uh, social uh, development for the next 25 years through 1958, right? <clears throat> the interesting thing to me was to look at what they did not mention. No transistors no atomic energy, no antibiotics, no faster than sound travel, no space probes. I mean, the U-2 preceded that, you see. And no World War II. Now, it struck me <clears throat> that those things had some sort of influence on those 25 years. So I started looking at prediction, and I've been following it very carefully ever since. Herman Kahn, the late Herman Kahn, fascinated me because he was another one of these absolutists, as Roosevelt was, because by appointing the brain trust, he was playing along with this mythology that you can lay out the future. And the whole idea of the future struck me as rather interesting because... That's almost a Presbyterian statement. If it's the future, it's already there, and we're just approaching it. it. Nothing's going to change. It'll just unfold suddenly, and there it'll be. So the future is one of these great mythological statements that's buried in the language. What I'm addressing is this whole idea of absolutes. And your helplessness in the face of such overwhelming movements in mankind. Now, we get overwhelmed occasionally, but I think each of us has a future, and lots of times individuals can have a tremendous influence on the futures of all of us. I don't have to list the people from Michelangelo on, just from that time, to make this an important statement to you. Einstein, these people said, they were almost on a one track. They said, hey, this is, this is fascinating, and I'm going to study it and see what I can discover. And this is the door I would like to open to you especially. It's one of the reasons, one of the major reasons I came here today, because you are engineering students. Now, you're movers. You take the substance of our universe and you do things with it. Now, I've been playing that game for years because when I'm not writing books, I'm experimenting with a dedicated word processor that we've been working on for five years. <clears throat> I'm building uh, with my own hands uh, things to reduce the energy load of my house in the Northwest 
making uh, solar collectors out of grab bag materials, seconds in uh, thermopane and beer cans. It was fun getting the materials together. <coughs> <clears throat> and these things work. I made a methane collector <clears throat> out of uh, uh, truck inner tubes, which wasn't, well, it was successful. <clears throat> it uh, allowed me to uh, use the methane from uh, poultry manure to singe them when we slaughtered them and put them down in the freezer, which I called using everything about the pig, including the squeal. <clears throat> When I wrote Dragon in the Sea, my preferred title was Under Pressure, about a submersible carriers for liquid cargo. I experimented and made uh, models, <clears throat> found out how to, how to get a hydrostatic balance with different cargos, with oil and whatnot, <clears throat> so that when I wrote the book, I was speaking from personal knowledge. I went down in a submarine at the dock. They took me down. They couldn't take it out in Puget Sound, but they could, at the dockside with ring ties, submerge it to show me how it worked. So I went down in a submarine. <clears throat> I did all of these things because <clears throat> how we influence our surroundings the impact of human effort on the world around us is the most fascinating thing about our world to me. I wrote the Dune series because I had this idea that charismatic leaders ought to come with a warning label on the forehead, may be dangerous to your health. I mean, I think the most dangerous president we've had, or one of the most dangerous at least, not because he was a bad guy, but because people didn't question him, one of the most dangerous presidents that we've had in this century was Jack Kennedy. Because people said, yes, sir, Mr. Charismatic Leader, what do we do next? <clears throat> and we wound up in Vietnam. People don't realize that he was one of the major moving forces getting us into Vietnam because he locked us into <clears throat> a commitment there. And I think probably the most valuable president of this century was Richard Nixon because he taught us to, to distrust government. <clears throat> <clears throat> and he did it by example. <clears throat> <clears throat> Which is the best kind of teaching. Well, anyway, I wanted to do this thing about messiahs and charismatic leaders. I mean, why do 900 people go to Guyana and drink poison Kool-Aid? Why do the citizens of an entire nation, most of the citizens anyway, say Sieg Heil and murder some three million Jews and gypsies? <clears throat> why do they not question their leaders? Okay, I was going to do this book, <clears throat> and I started researching a lot of things. The research is, oh boy, that's the fun part. <clears throat> Anthropology, comparative religions, <clears throat> geology. <clears throat> I spent six years preparing, and in the middle of all of that, I went down to a place on the coast of Oregon called Florence, Oregon, because I was supporting a very expensive writing habit by being a journalist. <clears throat> I was going to do an article about the U.S. Department of Agriculture's project at Florence, Oregon to control sand dunes. Now, sand dunes are like slow-motion waves. <clears throat> they'll move across roads, across highways. They'll inundate whole plantations of forest. But they do it slowly. And <clears throat> I was flying an airplane over this experimental project, this test station on the coast of Oregon, <clears throat> leaning out the window, taking pictures. The desert, of course, is the wilderness of the Bible. And, these, and the desert, the wilderness, is where a great many religions have originated. And I started researching ecology, how we inflict ourselves upon the planet. 
Well, after six years of this marvelously interesting research, I had the system loaded, and I sat down to do a book. The book as I conceived of it was the first three books. They were one book in my head. And I told my <clears throat> agent this, and after he recovered from his heart attack, <clears throat> he said, do you think you could split it into three, at least, maybe four? <clears throat> well, I split it into three, and I thought I was through with it, except that I had created a character in the third one who would not leave my head. Now, authors have a solution to that. We can write them into a... <clears throat> Having done that, I had opened Pandora's box. <laughs> And I was having so much fun with it, and I told people I would continue to write Dune books as long as they interested me and as long as they interested the readers. <clears throat> and that's what I've been doing. <clears throat> I have been having fun with what I do, which, if I give you nothing else about what you do with your lives and these interesting things that you've learned in this excellent educational institution, Institution, a marvelous word. <clears throat> Find something that you like to do. And even if you're supporting your habit by something that you don't like as well, the two together. That's what I did by becoming a journalist. Remember that. There's nothing at all wrong with saying that the Protestant ethic <clears throat> is full of it. <clears throat> that it's all right to enjoy your work. You don't have to fight your way out of bed every morning. You can get up every morning eager to go do whatever it is you do. Have a love affair with your, with your world. And remember that you're not going to be able to predict every consequence of what you do. <clears throat> there is so much about what I do on that experimental farm in the Northwest that what I'm doing. The farm in the country where you go and become absolute version of the home-built catch that you get into and sail off to a South Sea island where brown-skinned maidens pour coconut juice in your mouth. Not to mention the sand crabs and the flies and the other things that are down there. <clears throat> Mythology is a great beckoner. It says, come on, come on. It's great in here. Come on. Examine your mythologies. Examine your absolutist criteria. Question things. I have the most fun when I'm writing questioning things that people do not question. The assumptions that everybody knows are true. I'm going to declare a heresy for you. All science, if you go back into its roots, saying... Why do I believe this? Well, I believe this because of these tests and this, this proof. Well, why do I believe this? Why did I set up this test? Why did I believe that proof? All science goes back to something that we believe because we believe it. We believe it because we believe it. And we have no proof for it. It's like a religion. So when you dig into the roots of science, a gray area at the bottom. But it's like a balloon. And the surface is word the computer science has given us. <laughs> I love this language. <clears throat> the surface of the balloon is the interface with what we do not know. Inside the balloon, as we blow into it, is what we have proved, okay? But as we increase what we think we know, we increase our exposure to what we do not know. This is one of the inevitable laws of our universe. 
But isn't it more interesting to live in a universe where there are unknowns to discover, new lands to explore, than to live in an absolute box where when you find the edge, that's it, baby. <laughs> no place to go from there. I like the fact that we cannot predict everything. I like the fact that we live in a universe where anything may happen. Because the alternative to me is a constricting dead end. In my original conception of the first Dune book, those first three books, I had Paul blind in the second book because, to my way of thinking, that was the ultimate exploration of absolute prediction. He did not need to see. He knew what was going to happen. He knew who was all around him without eyes. Now you think about that a minute. I won't give you a full minute to think about it. <clears throat> You'd start squirming in your seats. But <clears throat> think of you right now, an absolute, unvarying, invariant to you from this moment here in this room to the moment of your death. I can't predict be an absolute, utter bore. Your life would be instant replay. You'd be sitting there now saying, Oh, next he's going to say, Oh my God, he's saying it. <laughs> and you would not be able to change a thing. <clears throat> now this really states the fallacy that Herman Kahn, wanting to set our future in concrete, I'm sorry about that, <clears throat> and Roosevelt and others find it so difficult to face. It is the unexpected, the surprises that make the important differences in our lives, even some of the nasty surprises. Now I said <clears throat> that I was going to give you about a half hour to ask questions because as far as I'm concerned, <clears throat> this is not communication. <clears throat> now I'm up here playing lecturer and you're down there playing audience. And we each know the role, don't we? Hmm? We've played it before. <laughs> we learn this very young. We learn how to find out what that figure up there wants, and then we regurgitate that for them. <clears throat> I came on the fallacy of this, before I get into the Q&As, <clears throat> I came on the fallacy of this one time <clears throat> when I was in the fourth grade. 10 years old. I had a teacher who had been a teacher for a long time. She was a large woman. You know any, know any women who have wear tight sleeves and their fe flesh bulges out? She was one of those. And she wore these glasses that looked like the bottoms of Coke bottles. <clears throat> and her class just bored the hell out of me. <clears throat> I would read the book and I'd know the answers and so I'd come to class to throw spit wads and <laughs> do other disruptive things. And I was continually being asked to stay after school. And she was one of these ruler users, you know, hold out your palm, wham! She could have been a nun without any trouble at all. <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> I had done something terrible in one class. I don't know what it was, but <clears throat> she brought me up finally to sit beside her desk, and she had a chair beside her desk. Now, Torquemada, I think, designed this setup. <clears throat> the chair sat so that my knees were exposed beyond the edge of her desk, <clears throat> and she sat right there correcting papers forever. <clears throat> Now, an imaginative ten, I don't know what to do to you. And your imagination can construct a lot of things that she will do to you, including the bastinado. <clears throat> I was terrified. <clears throat> and I sat there, and I sat there, sweating it out, not able to utter a word. And finally, she had a platform, and her chair swiveled 
wheels on it, and she wheeled over right in front of me, and she was right there. <clears throat> and she said, I don't know what to do with you. Well, I made an ultimate mistake right then. <clears throat> because teachers go to special courses to learn how to deal with problem children and how not to lose their cool. So I said, why are you mad at me? I was practically crying. She got all red in the face, reached forward and grabbed my shoulders and she was shaking me, pulling me up to those pop bottles and back, saying, I'm not mad, I'm not mad. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see that she's mad, but what's coming out of her mouth disagrees with that. So what I learned right there, I didn't put it all together, but I learned to be watchful. <clears throat> I learned that you don't pay as much attention to what people say as to what they do. What they do is the real jungle telegraph. That tells you what they're really up to. Now it is that jungle telegraph that is a main leap motif of my writing. What's underground? Where does the word iatrogenic come from? It means a disease or other difficulty created by the doctor or what is done to you in the name of the doctor. Why is it that we keep approaching the problem of hard drugs the same way, even though we know the system doesn't work, it never has? And we know that at least 75% of the new users, we have good, good solid information on this from studies that have been made by SRI and others, <clears throat> that at least 75% of the new users are not joyriders. They're people turned on to the hard drugs by the existing addicts to build a market to support their own habits. So why don't we look at it and say, hey, we're not going to really eliminate the problem, but we may be able to reduce the impact on our society by taking the profit out of it. Only about 11.5% of the new users are joyriders. The rest are created by medicine and other factors. More than 75% are created by the system. But we have a big bureaucracy and a big criminal <coughs> system that supports itself on it with a lot of money. It supports a big bureaucracy. It has enough money on the criminal side to buy FBI agents. I hope you all read the news and know this is true. To buy whole strings of border guards. To buy the uh, <clears throat> briefcases of envoys from foreign countries. To buy the key to the police storeroom in New York City. Do you know what happened to the heroin in the French connection? It disappeared from the police storeroom in New York City. It just vanished. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> so if we take the profit out of it and turn it over to the Public Health Service and say, okay, we know we're not going to solve the problem this way, but we will at, re at least reduce the arena in which it occurs if we make it available at 50 cents a crack at a public health service right out of it then we have because most of the theft in New York City and other major cities right now supports the heroin and other hard drugs the rug out from under the criminal syndicate or a major element of the criminal, criminal syndicate but we have also done something else we have your and who's not, who's guilty and who's innocent in a different way. And a lot of people have trouble with that. We want to know who the goats are, the sacrificial goats are. But I'm suggesting to you that we could do this practically overnight. When they did it in England, what happened immediately? It was fascinating. Well, the first thing was that the criminal syndicate turned to major robberies. 
That's when that big train holdup occurred in England. Because we had taken a large part of their income away from them. Okay, enough of these crazy ideas from a crazy science fiction writer. Grand Canyon between us, I wish we're not there. I wish we were sitting in a room with a few beers and rapping. But we can't do that. Okay. What's on your minds? Up and ask me a question. Show me a hand. What's this guy down here? The Benny Jesuit in the book Dune, yeah. Well, we do it with cattle <laughs> and dogs <clears throat> and the uh, aristocrats of our world have done it for centuries. The question is, do I think it's wrong to uh, uh, meddle in the randomity of genetic selection? I was making a point that unexpected things can happen. I've made that point several times in different books. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> that, was, that was what I was doing. I know we're going to do these things. We have done them in the past and we're going to do them again. So I was just saying, what happens? What if? Which is the beautiful door that's open in science fiction, why I write it. There's lots of elbow room. I was saying that the Bene Gesserit had been doing this for a long time. They had this end in mind and they got something they did not expect. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? There's another question right over here. Speak up so I can hear you well. Oh, the, the, hold on. This guy with the mic over here. Hi. My name yeah. is Paul Twine. I would like to know what inspired you to write the book Dune. What? What, what inspired you to write Dune? What inspired? Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to treat with a, a treat an idea about how and how much do we contribute to the power they hold over us. And as it is today, the rest is history. <clears throat> I decided I was going to write, by the way, when I was age eight. How many of you in here want to write? Hey, good, come on in, the water's fine. <clears throat> and the competition, really, don't forget about competition. We're not in competition. The more of us who are writing well, the more people are going to read, and the better it is for all of us. Mr. Herbert, <clears throat> I'm on your right. Okay. Over there? Okay. Yeah. As a major author of great creativity and insight, you have gained the respect of millions, yet... Gee, watch out for my head, it's coming up like a balloon. <laughs> I think it's going to go okay. down in a sec. Yet you have chosen to cast token gay characters in a negative light. The images that you present in your popular work Dune and its movie specifically can only well, I promote... I didn't do the movie, you understand that. ...can only promote bigotry and violence against lesbians and gay men and of course, science. What I, what I was doing with the, with, the, <clears throat> with the gay population there, I was only saying one thing. <clears throat> I was saying that, <clears throat> that homosexuality is a natural occurrence in our society. Uh, <clears throat> in your teens, you're naturally this way. And some people are beyond. And primitive societies have dealt with it in a different way than our society deals with it. And lots of times we create the aberrant gay, and there are aberrant gays just as there are aberrant other individuals, by our social reactions to them. <clears throat> and I just gave you an aberrant gay in the, in the Dune books. But what I was also saying to you was that <clears throat> sadomasochism sometimes is a part of this. I can give you chapter and verse on that. And that gays have a, hard, a much harder problem coming out of the social pressures than the rest of us do in many instances. But I didn't have anything else in mind for this. That, that was what I was doing. Well, I hope that in the future yeah. that you portray in any books that you do write in the future do in mm -hmm. fact well, there's another thing I was saying. responsibly represent lesbians and gays in a manner consistent with your non-lesbian, non-gay characters. Well, this, the, another thing I was saying is that gays have opted to not continue the species. <laughs> That's just true. <clears throat> 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 
Now, <clears throat> um, yeah, it, well, it's a choice anybody can make. I've made that choice with my new lady because there are enough of us already. I mean, I didn't, uh, <clears throat> I had three children uh, and a 35 year marriage, and my wife died. I thought that was the end of it. But it wasn't. haven't opted for anything. <laughs> Of course, I, I, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. Now, a person doesn't. A person doesn't choose. <clears throat> it happens, but it happens for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Sometimes it happens for psychological reasons. Well, <clears throat> um, it's a lot more difficult. <clears throat> That is going to be a sensation. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Herbert. Yeah. On your left. I'd like to thank you for the enjoyment you've given me through your books. You're a really good author. I enjoy it. And I was wondering, in your book, Dune Series, the Bene Gesserit seemed like paired the honored madres. What would you... What They're would you a mean? kind of a wild offshoot. Yeah, but, but much more rambunctious. <laughs> much, always, but most of the time willing to take a back seat and be the king makers rather than to get up front and be the king which can have its bad points you know because we tend to treat uh, people with power uh, rather badly occasionally <clears throat> you see <clears throat> I think that there is a bad idea around in our world and that idea is that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely I think what really happens is that power attracts the corruptible. And have been reading the news out of Bonn called the Kremlin, the Pentagon. I would make it a criminal offense for any military officer to accept after retirement. In fact, to accept uh, giving the fox the key to the chicken coop. And of course we get gold-plated weapons and whatnot that are absolutely useless. I can document, I was a correspondent in Vietnam and risked my neck over there to learn it firsthand. <clears throat> um, I can document <clears throat> that trying to gold plate the M16 cost us about 10 to 15,000 lives, 10,000 to 15,000 lives in Vietnam. Of course, Vietnam was a disaster from word one. <clears throat> but the military made all kinds of egregious errors over there. I was fascinated by the thing around Westmoreland because I hoped against hope that he would never win that case. Not because I thought he was a liar, but I know we were lied to over there. I can document that. <clears throat> and if Westmoreland didn't know it, that's it. <laughs> I know the difficulties in adapting literature to the screen, but I really felt cheated in the way they changed the ending for to. Okay, let me give you a, a capsule history of how that happened. There's about five hours of Dune on film. The distributors want a film of about two hours so they can show it more than once in a day and get their money. And they put the arm on Universal to cut it that much. But now there's a kind of a little underground movement to. Uh, put all that film back in there and create a mini-series. <clears throat> and if they do, I will try again, I tried before and failed, I will try again to change the ending and get that damn rainstorm out of there because... This is Engineers Week and we've had... I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm... okay. I just... this is... Horse Pucky. <laughs> as, that's as I want to know what you thought about that because there's so yeah. much that we do that it's important. It's interesting and useful things with the knowledge you have gained here. And that's why I'm... I was wondering if you could elaborate on your, um, your experiments with a soul-sufficient environment or... As part of our social glue. I think it is dangerous for everybody to go off and become their own little thing. Okay, well, um, I think when I read your, uh, read your books, you have a little, they had a little um, uh, um, note on you in the back that said you're dealing with an energy self-sufficient. I don't mean so. Well, that's right. Okay. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Oh, you want me to elaborate on what I did up there? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, we played with a panamone 
Gee, I don't have to explain a Panamon to this audience, do we? <coughs> we played with a Panamon wind machine. <coughs> um, and, uh, well, I'm a pilot. And so we went back to what we've learned from aircraft design and redesigned the blades. Keeping in mind that we wanted something to be stamped out rather quickly, the way they're stamping them out over here. A Ten-foot tall model uh, on the roof of a... Uh, uh, shop in Astoria, Oregon, produces uh, seven and a half horsepower in a 50 knot wind, but the important thing is it works in a 50 knot wind. How many of you have seen this uh, uh, windmill orchard over on the way to the desert? Yeah. Horizontal axis wind machines, they're a dead end street. They have to be feathered out when the wind gets around 35 knots. We need something that can be used in high winds. Ours is designed to operate in a 90 knot wind. <clears throat> and we patented it. Nobody seems to be interested in it yet. But uh, we're back redesigning it and improving it. A wrecked truck uh, van for $150 an hour, <clears throat> uh, 10 to 20 times streets on a, on a backcountry road. All I had to do was phone down to the sheriff's the bureaucracy has taken over. Well, that was one of the reasons I chose this small town to do this sort of thing. <clears throat> we experimented with a duck pond. Duck manure is a great sealant for the bottom of ponds. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we created a culture in the pond that would grow lots of algae, and it fed the ducks about half their food. So we raised ducks with about half the input of purchased foods. And they were quite healthy ducks. <clears throat> they tasted nice, too. <laughs> Canard all orange from your own pond. <clears throat> well, if you don't have fun doing these things, why do them? <laughs> <clears throat> That's what we did up there. Dollars. And we did it just before oil started to skyrocket. That's what we did. And that's what you can do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, right. Okay. Yes, I have a question about your career choices. I think I read somewhere that you had once considered a career in marine biology. Is this As a marine, well, no, I'd, I'd been a, um, I had an uncle who was one of the first aquaculturists in the Pacific Northwest. He brought in oysters in a place called Henderson Cove. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he also used some Japanese exchange students from the University of Washington Fisheries Department during the summer to work for him. And I went over there and they taught me what they knew about oyster culture. <clears throat> and I didn't think of this as a career to follow. It was an interesting thing I did for a time. <clears throat> uh, what I had almost became was a professional historian. I debated that one time. That was a, a possible career choice. Yes. You are? Okay. Uh -huh. I don't know any beyond that. Probably not. And is, is Duncan Idaho? Yes. The noble savage, of course, in this, on this continent was the American Indian, <clears throat> who did everything right. Not quite. Once the horse got in here, things were <laughs> very, very different. And even without the horse, the Indians probably would have wiped out the buffalo before long because they had developed a system of, of driving them off cliffs and taking what they could. So even primitive societies do not always make the best choices. They operate without any real awareness of how they wipe out their substance, the sustenance that they depend on. Just the way are tied to each other. The Canadian lynx will kill off enough rabbits that the population drops dramatically the lynx population drops, the rabbit population comes up, the lynx population comes up, and it's just a sine curve. So that's the kind of game I'm playing. Okay, over here where I can see you. Uh, hi, Mr. Herbert. I'd like to start out by saying I've enjoyed your books very much. Uh, You're supposed to. If you, don't, <laughs> if you don't enjoy them, I'm cheating you. <laughs> okay, some books are not designed for pleasure, though. So, uh, in now, you Dune, get a lot of those here, I would imagine. <laughs> in Dune, uh, there are some aspects of that book 
such as the Butlerian Jihad and uh, some of the conditions on Dune itself, which uh, prevents a kind of free reign of scientific knowledge and the use of science. Uh, most, uh, most science fiction has kind of a negative view of science and views it as kind of a, a potential monster, uh, anti-nature -na force. No, it's a uh, natural force. I want to know your opinion on that. Yeah, we're natural. We're part of nature. What we produce is part of nature. It is the interpretation of consequences that interests me, anyway. <clears throat> what happens when you do this? Uh, <clears throat> you see, I think that <clears throat> one of the most serious errors that we made as a democracy was the creation of a civil service. And it was sold to us on the basis of a lie. The lie was that that was the only way to correct the excesses of the spoil system. It was not the only way. But what it did was it took <clears throat> a greater and greater element of power out of the control of the voter. It watered down your vote. <clears throat> and every bureaucracy of this kind in history, and I have read my history carefully, every such bureaucracy eventually becomes an aristocracy, just as it has in the Soviet Union. They have demonstrated the truth of what I'm telling you. They have developed an aristocratic bureaucracy over there. What are the, what are the tests of an aristocracy? <clears throat> the aristocrats get all the perks. Hmm? They don't have to stand in lines to get their meat. They have cars, they have servants, they have special dachas for <clears throat> their vacations. But the ultimate test is do they pass the power along to their children? Yeah. They do it quite openly now, and it's announced in Pravda. <clears throat> We're a long way down that road in the United States. We don't have to go down that road, and I hope we don't. Because I believe, I really believe in power to the people. I think if you put responsibility on people, we rise to the occasion. And I know a lot of closet aristocrats <clears throat> in our society. Some calling themselves liberal and some calling themselves conservative. <clears throat> who are fostering this bureaucratic growth. And it doesn't make a damn bitter difference whether it's a fascist bureaucracy, a so-called capitalist or oligarchic bureaucracy, or a communist or socialist bureaucracy. To the people looking up at the bottom of it, they're identical. When was the last time you were treated courteously by a bureaucrat? They don't have to treat you courteously. You can't fire them. You can't vote them out of office. Okay, have I, have I kind of skirted around and answered some of your question at least? Uh... Well, I basically wanted to know what your view on science itself On was. science itself? Okay, on science. Uh, <clears throat> I, I speak to a lot of um, <clears throat> political science audiences. And I love to get in front of them and ask them, <clears throat> how many of you believe politics is a science? This is a mythology of science. Science fiction. Really, what most of us write is technological fiction. We say, what will happen if this technological development, coming out of science, admittedly, <clears throat> runs this course? What happens to the society, to individuals in the society? <clears throat> My view of science is that it is a natural outgrowth of man's curiosity. And therefore, it is natural. It is the consequences of what we bring up that we have to deal with. And it's very important, extremely important, increasingly important, that we start looking into how we interact as societies on one planet. That's all we have. Now, I am not a hot gospel ecologist. We got into these problems together. We've got to get out of them together. I don't believe in trying to find the guilty and saying, get them and put in a new gang. 
If I had been born in my grandfather's time, I would have made my grandfather's mistakes. I just think it's nonsense, stupidity, to make my grandfather's mistakes today. That's my view of science. Thank you. Uh, in your books, you stress individual responsibility. I'm, 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 I have difficulty hearing you. Can okay. you get up to the... <laughs> in your books, you stress individual responsibility. And I was wondering what you think we as a society can do to promote this, since it doesn't exist, really. I don't think so a society can do it. I think individuals have to do it. What do you think we as individuals can do? Well, you all can make choices, you know. <clears throat> we all have to make choices in what we perceive as good and evil. I had to speak at a Jesuit university at their commencement exercises not long ago. I'll, I'll give you the speech. I got up and I said, <clears throat> you're all graduating today, and you expect me to tell you what you will face out there in that big real world. The only thing I'm going to tell you is that if only one of you chooses to live by the golden rule, this will be a better world. And I sat down. <clears throat> the applause lasted longer than the speech. I think they were applauding the shortness of the speech. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but you see, if you do look at your fellow human beings as individuals with feelings and hang-ups the way you have some and say, well, if I can help you, I will. I'll try not to exacerbate your problems. I won't always succeed. But that's my main goal. Then this is a better world. But you have to make the choice individually. And you have to make it all the time. You can't make it once for the rest of your life. <clears throat> you can be like some people are and you say, uh, uh, well, if I don't, George will. I mean, all, that just makes two of you, you see, and you can each lean on each other and say, I'm doing it because George did, does it, and George can say, I'm doing it because you're doing it. So don't fall into that trap. And yeah, people will take advantage of you, of you if you try to live this way. But they hurt themselves more than they hurt you. They really do. I'm happy with my life. I have no trouble at all looking in the mirror every day, most days anyway. I make mistakes. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> and shaving every morning. I do shave, so there's no beard now. <clears throat> um, it's just an ongoing commitment that you have to make, and you have to do it individually, and society cannot do it for you. Hi. Um, concerning the, uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, concerning the uh, seventh Dune book you're planning, do you ha uh, plan to have it like go back in the history of the saga to, you know, kind of explore the rise of the guild? To do a prequel, you mean? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to do a short story or a really? novelette on this in the next year. Okay, great. And my second question is, did uh, Lucas ever pay off on that dinner he owes you? <laughs> no, Lucas has never admitted that uh, they copied a lot of Dune. I'm not saying they did. I'm just saying that there are 16 points of identity between the book Dune and Star Wars. Now, you've had stat. What? What is it? It's 16 times 16. 16 times <clears throat> over 1. The odds against that being coincidence. There aren't that many stars in the universe. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I think he at least owes us a dinner, if only out of coincidence. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Herbert, I just wanted to announce that we only have time for two or three more questions. And okay. to also remind people that there will be a book signing afterwards. Uh, why, don't we, <clears throat> why don't we knock it off with uh, a question here and a question there. Okay. Um, with the widespread use of the computer and dependency on it being such a recent phenomenon, uh, I find it fascinating that Destination Void was written when it was. And my question is, when you wrote that, did you have the Jesus incident in mind, or was that a later idea? No, that was a later idea, the Jesus incident was. <clears throat> Destination Void was uh, an exploration of our 
<clears throat> unconscious commitment to the idea that the only thing wrong with the universe is that we haven't invented the right machine yet. Yes. Okay, my question concerns um, your creative process when you write. When you have a book, when, when you write your books, it's a whole new world, ecology, etc., etc., and then there's characters interacting in it. What comes first? How does it develop as you the, write? The, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> what comes first? Uh, an idea often, <clears throat> and then I people it. I say, this is, has to happen to somebody, and then it has to happen somewhere. Now, science fiction gives you the option of having an enormous open universe out there where you can have it happen anywhere you can invent. That's why I write science fiction. And I have to close it down now because there are a lot of other things going on today. I've enjoyed this being with you, and I wish we could wrap together in smaller groups sometimes.